Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Yeah, one of the things that I married Norma said, Norma, don't leave glasses of water sitting around the house. <laughs> Doesn't work. <laughs> and you know what's funny is you can leave one, you can say, oh, it's back here in the back corner in the back room and then the back part of the, you know, and the lights are off and he'll never hit it. And it'll be five minutes and I'll push, knock it over. <laughs> you know, you just can't believe it the way that happens. I uh, want to say happy anniversary to the Legacy Group. Wow, I'm impressed. What a group. I'm glad to hear there's a lot of uh, fresh blood that flows through this group, the, young, the, the new sobriety. I'm glad to hear that. Uh, I'm very honored that the steering committee wanted to uh, invite me up here to this great event. And uh, Kim contacted us, and I was real excited. And, yes, I, uh, my wife is a big part of my life. Uh, she shares my recovery with me. And we, uh, we serve AA together. Uh, we're joined at the hip in that. You'll probably hear a little bit about that tonight. And so thanks to all of you. What a, what a spirit here. Somebody, uh, 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 Terry, uh, the Al-Anon, mentioned the International. How many of y'all went? Don't, don't raise your hand. Say. <laughs> <laughs> but you felt the spirit of the, I mean, didn't you feel it? Oh, my God. Now, now, just, don't you feel just a little bit of that right here? Oh, yeah. It's called the Spirit of AA. Yeah. So, I am Blind Dave, and I am an alcoholic. <laughs> I got sober in July of 98. So, um, it's been a, been a wonderful ride. I'll share a little bit of that with you tonight as well. I was born in 1948. In about a few weeks here, I'll be 62. Uh, I was born legally blind. Uh, probably a little worse than that. I'm, I'm not sure. But uh, I, I did manage to go to public school. Through about the second grade, I could put my face right down on the book and I could read it. And, uh, and I remember uh, one of those parent-teacher nights when, the te- when your parents come to school and meet your teacher and... And my folks saying, so how's Dave doing? And, uh, and the teacher said, you know, Dave really exhibits leadership qualities. My dad was real proud of that. Oh, you know, he, he was real proud of that. Uh, and I did uh, have, I guess you could call it leadership qualities. Uh, I remember being on the playground. I got in trouble with a couple of other boys. I was a little bitty kid. I'm still not that big, but I was real little as a, as a kid. And I got in trouble on the playground a couple of other boys, I probably came to about here on them, and we all got sent to the principal. So here we are marching to the principal, and I got these two guys that are head taller than me on both sides, and as we're going, I'm saying, y'all keep your mouth shut, I do the talking. <laughs> and uh, they kept their mouth shut. I, tell you, I, I did not want to put my life in someone else's hands anyway. So I got through the second grade. I couldn't see the book anymore. So the third grade, they got me a large print book. And by the end of the third grade, I couldn't see the large print book. So I was born in Houston, Texas. My folks sent me to Austin to go to the blind school in 1958. Now, um, the blind school is a boarding school with very rigid rules, as most boarding schools are. You live in a dorm. uh, They separate the boys from the girls. They have real rigid rules, you know. And uh, when you put me in that kind of a setting, I don't do well. <laughs> I- I'm glad I didn't go to the military. That would have even been worse. And uh, so I stayed in trouble at the blind school all the time. And one day while I was uh, being uh, administered my punishment, whatever, it-, it dawned on me what that teacher meant by I was a-, a good leader. What she was trying to tell my dad was that I was a bad follower. <laughs> So uh, 
I got through uh, about junior high. When I hit puberty, it got really bad there at the blind school. I, I really got out of control, and by the end of junior high, they just kicked me out. It wasn't the first time, but it was the time that they finally told my folks, don't send him back. So I went back to Houston to uh, resume life there. And uh, now when I was a little kid, my mother used to make me go to church. God dang, she'd wake me up every Sunday. I hated going to church. But when I got back as a, um, uh, you know, I guess I was about 16 at that time, 15 or 16, starting high school. And I remember that first Sunday she came in and said, got your clothes all pressed and laid out here and all ready for church. And I said, I'm not going. And she said, what? I said, I'm not going to church. I'm old enough to decide for myself if I want to do that. And I've decided I'm not going. And Mother cried. I remember she cried. And uh, I started high school then and uh, proclaimed myself to be an atheist. And I became a militant atheist. (laughs) Uh, Madeline O'Hare would have been proud of me. (laughs) I was very defiant against that whole scene and against God and the whole idea of God. Now, uh, the thing was, I, start, I was going to high school at a school where they had quite a little bunch of religious kids. And when they found out how defiant I was about all that, I was their target. And so I, usually when I'm in hanging out in the bathroom smoking a cigarette with some of the thugs I hung out with, <laughs> some of these Baptist boys would try to corner me and witness to me. <laughs> and man, I loved that because it became such a scene. I would attack them. I enjoyed it. Uh, it became such an intense scene that they would usually uh, back away from me just knowing that lightning was bound to going to strike any minute. <laughs> and they'd say, you're going to go to hell. And I'd say, to hell with you and to hell with your God. <clears throat> Another thing happened when I started high school, you know, public school, I met a girl. And uh, she sort of became my girlfriend and her folks was... Hard drinkers, alcoholics, I suppose, but they were definitely hard drinkers. And they didn't mind that we drank with them. Oh, man, this was great. Because I had been just released from that boarding school. I had been cooped up all my teenage years until now, and I was free. And I met this girl and her, and her drinking folks, and they just picked me up from school on Friday afternoon. And I just went over to their house for the weekend, and we drank all weekend. I got a good start. It was late, but, it, but I was off to, I was catching up. <laughs> and they dropped me back off at school on Monday morning. Uh, I graduated in 68. Now, y'all know what was happening in the 60s. There were some other things to sample also. And, <laughs> and you know, uh, and I'm, I, I remind myself where Bill said uh, a doctor came and began to administer some sedatives. Next day found me doing sedatives and gin. <laughs> This combination soon landed me on the rocks, and I want you to know that accelerated things for me. Didn't take long. Uh, I graduated in 68. Something I remember about 1969, an event that I'll never forget. I went to a rock concert on Halloween night, midnight, 1969. <laughs> to see a hot group that was, that was real big and just come to Houston for the first time, 1969. It was Grand Funk Railroad. <laughs> And, uh, and we had another band. It was kind of a local band that we'd been hearing about a little bit. This fellow, a local boy, was, got this band together. And we was all waiting to see what they were going to do. And uh, so this was their big debut. They were going to open up for Grand Funk Railroad. And we were all wondering uh, what this uh, ZZ Top was going to sound like. <laughs> yeah, I'm in the right crowd here. <laughs> But what I remember about that rock concert was standing out there in the line uh, waiting to get in. And a couple of little Jesus freaks come by and tried to pass, uh, hand me some literature. <laughs> and I did my usual thing. I attacked them. Uh, so ferociously that I drew a crowd. The whole crowd was gathered around cheering for me. <laughs> and that, you just didn't want to try talking to me about God. That was in 69 and then 70 and 71 and 72, and, man, I was hitting bottom hard by then. Uh, I was doing everything I could to try to bring this runaway freight train into control and not doing a good job, and I was getting scared. I didn't want nobody to know I was getting scared, but I was. And uh, I know what when it says pitiful and incomprehensible demoralization, you might find out how scared I am because I can't stop this thing. 
Well, in March of 1973, I was standing out in my front yard, and a fellow who was my new neighbor came over to introduce himself to me. Uh, he was a Christian, and he tried to turn the conversation toward God, and I went on the attack. And I lit into this dude and bounced off of him. Hmm. Never encountered anybody like him. He pulled a Bible out of his pocket. He carried one. <laughs> and man, he started flipping through that Bible and countered all my arguments. Uh, he was not he was not hostile. He was calm. He was commanding. And he brought the presence of God into that moment that broke me. Nobody could have done it but him. He was an angel that God sent. It took him a couple of months being my neighbor, talking to me here and there, and sharing with me a little bit of his testimony that I came to believe. And I never will forget the day that I kneeled down and gave my life to God. Got up from that prayer a different person. Threw away everything in the house, just cleaned out the house. Felt freed from the, the obsession was gone. I felt freed. I knew I was freed. And, um, but what is the, you know, that's what we call the third step experience. I had a very powerful third step experience. But what does the big book say we're supposed to do immediately following the third step? Mm-hmm. A searching and fearless moral inventory of ourselves. That third step decision, it says, would have little permanent effect unless it once followed by a strenuous effort to face and be rid of the things in ourselves which have been blocking us. Well, you know what? Those church people didn't know how to take me any further than that. They did take me that far. And I got excited about, you know, this new thing. And I went off to church with this dude. And uh, I could shout hallelujah as loud as anybody. And, uh, and I played music a little bit too. And it wasn't long they had me up there involved with the, the worship team. And I was leading worship in church. Can you believe that? And uh, before long I became a deacon in this church. And uh, then after a few years I got a little license and started doing some preaching on the side. And then one day I went off to East Texas and started a little church. Tried my hand at being a pastor. I really learned how to do church good. <laughs> but you know, the big book says that if we don't do that inventory, what we do not learn is enough humility, fearlessness, and honesty in the sense we find it necessary. We who? Mm -hmm, we alcoholics. I hadn't learned that. And so sure enough, the day came when I had this thought that said, you know, my real problem was drugs. Um, I, yeah, y'all had that thought. So surely a couple of drinks isn't going to hurt anything. So just starting with the idea that I was just going to have a couple of drinks now and then, I resume having a real problem with alcohol. And again, as the big book says, more than most people, the alcoholic leads a double life. Mm. And so the day came when I started finding myself preaching the Bible with a hangover. <laughs> and for many years, teaching and preaching the Bible with a hangover was the recurring theme in my life. Every time I'd hit a new bottom, I'd change brands of religion, thinking there's something wrong with our theology here. And this other group over here promised that they had more power, so I'd switch churches, thinking this new one's going to fix me. And you know, for a while I'd think I was fixed. During one of those times when I thought I was fixed, I moved to Austin. Had a fellow here played slide guitar, and I like to play harmonica and sing the blues, and we started a little gospel blues kind of music ministry there in Austin. And, uh, and so one day we was playing at a little coffee shop off of 6th Street down there and uh, doing our songs about God, and there was a girl in there. She, uh, she heard us singing. She kind of had a little thing going with God, too. So she came up and introduced herself to us. Well, I just started kind of a little home church thing going on there in Austin. I was new in Austin, so I, I invited her to come to that. And she showed up, found out she was in AA. You know, I was surprised to learn that AA was a spiritual program. And I was real intrigued with its simplicity. Good grief, I was trying to solve this riddle. You know, this, this church, that church, something wrong here. What is it? Study it harder, bro. Oh. And the simplicity of AA, it looked beautiful. But, of course, I'm fixed right now. <laughs> so we became good friends. And, uh, 
usually on Saturday, I'd go to an open AA meeting with her. And on Sunday, she came to my little home church thing, Bible study. And uh, for a time, all went well. And after a couple of years, we got married. Um, I got to know a lot of her AA friends. And uh, some of them would now and then come to my little Bible study. For a time, all went well. Until that inevitable day, when I thought it'd be okay to have a drink now. And started that little snowball rolling down the mountain again. And before long, I'm living a double life again. Trying really hard to keep keep it hid, you know. And, and I was keeping the worst of it hid pretty well, uh, which in my mind meant that I was controlling it. You don't know what I mean. As long as you don't find out, I'm controlling it. So... <laughs> And so, but I'm really struggling with it. I'm really struggling. I, you know, I can't hardly contain it. I mean, uh, and one day I'm sitting in an AA meeting with my wife, frustrated to the max. I mean, I just couldn't sneak enough to satisfy me. And, uh, and, and I was wishing she'd go off for the weekend on one of them AA retreats or something. <laughs> I'm mad at everybody. I'm mad at the whole world. How did I end up married into AA? <laughs> and, you know, and, and I know that she's probably hoping I'm going to realize, and, and I'm sitting there going, I know she wants me to say I'm an alcoholic, and I'm not an alcoholic. I'm controlling it. She don't even have an idea how much I'm drinking. You know, and, and so, <laughs> and I was mad. I, was, I wanted to just blow the place up. And then this guy opened the big book and read that day. He said, you know, most of us have been unwilling to admit that we're real alcoholics. No person likes to think he is bodily and mentally different from his fellows. Therefore, it is not surprising that our drinking careers have been characterized by countless vain attempts to prove we could drink like a normal person. The idea that somehow, someday, he will control and enjoy his drinking is the great obsession of every abnormal drinker. He said, you know, here's the real earmark of an alcoholic. He said, if you happen to be controlling your drinking, you're not happy about it. <laughs> and man, I felt like that, that dude, I'll never forget the moment, because he, he stood in the back of that room and shot an arrow across that room and got me right in the chest. It was me and him in that room and nobody else. And he nailed me to the wall with the big book. Can you believe that? Thank God for big book thumpers. <laughs> and that was the day that I knew that I was going to have to join this fellowship and work these steps if I was going to ever stay sober and be happy about it. But that, proved, uh, that, that posed a little problem, you see, because... I've been around AA long enough to hear y'all talking about this fearless humility and this rigorous honesty. And that's kind of scary when you've been a little preacher leading a double life and you've got lots of secrets. I talked to an old man around her AA group and he was able to help me find the courage to walk into the meeting and announced to all my wife's friends who had known me for quite a few years as a little preacher. And to say, my name is Dave and I'm an alcoholic. Can y'all help me? And you know, I'll never forget that. It's, a, it's quite a journey, isn't it? Yeah. You never forget those moments. That hurt me to do that. Crushed my religious pride. I uh, One time when I was a kid, I got a... I don't know, I got a splinter or something in my hand. It got infected, and then it started blood poisoning, and that streak was going up my arm. And one day I was at the doctor. And I wasn't responding to nothing. And the doctor decided he was going to have to lance that thing. And, uh, and so he, I'm laying on the little table, you know, with the papers on it and stuff. And, uh, and, he, and he gets my arm really down tight, holding it between his knee and his side. I didn't know what he was fixing to do. And uh, he sprayed my hand with something cold, I guess, was supposed to numb it. And he took that scalpel and went, whop, whop, cut an X in my hand that I didn't know was coming. I ain't kidding you. They had to peel me off the ceiling. <laughs> and uh, it hurt. But you know what? That thing had been throbbing for days, hurting me at night. And after he slashed that thing open, I felt the draining start. I felt the healing begin. I slept that night. 
And that's the way it was when I walked into that room and had to crush my religious pride and say I'm an alcoholic and maybe I need your help. That gutted me. Step one just slashed me open and gutted me. But I felt the healing begin. And I came to step two, and I have another problem with step two, because it says we came to believe that a power greater than ourself could restore us to sanity. And I said, wait, wait a minute, I came to believe 25 years ago and have not been able to stay sober. And what, what should I expect AA to be any different? Why should I expect AA to be any different? Uh, I'm not just now coming to believe. Uh, I'm not going to change my God or my faith. I still have those. You know, I still have my same Lord. I still have my same faith. And, uh, and I'm not going to change any of that, so why should I expect anything to be any different in AA? And uh, what about this word sanity? Are they implying I'm insane? <laughs> but as I read the big book, I found out they were talking about the insanity that precedes the first drink. Ding. That rang a little bell. And... Uh, the more I read the big book and heard people in meetings, because, you know, uh, in, in, they talk about the, the, the insanity about that first drink. You know, I never heard about that. Uh, in church, the Bible says, be not drunk with wine, but be ye filled with the Holy Ghost. And I used to preach that, be not drunk with wine, but be ye filled with the Holy Ghost. You know, and uh, <laughs> I can still do that. <laughs> But I would uh, then leave church and think, you know, I'm not going to get drunk. I'm just going to have that couple of drinks. <laughs> and I never knew that it started, the problem started with me with the first drink until y'all taught me that. And as I would read more of the big book and then listen to y'all in the meetings, put the big book in perspective for me, uh, I started learning a lot about alcoholism and about the solution to alcoholism. I learned about me, the alcoholic, and the hopelessness uh, apart from the spirit. You know, and I, I don't know. If one day I'm sitting in an AA meeting, and ding, the light goes on, and I came to believe that the same old God that I'd had for 25 years who couldn't keep me sober over there, and none of them, the different ones I opt to, was now going to use a different avenue. That he was now going to start speaking to me in the language of the big book, and he was going to use the voice of another alcoholic. And I was going to hear my same old God in a brand new way. I came to believe that God does something very unique, very exclusive and very unique for alcoholics through alcoholics. And that was step two for me. And step three, I made a decision to turn my will and life over to the care of God as I understood Him. And I'm, so I'm reading step three, and it says, When we sincerely took such a position, all sorts of remarkable things followed. We had a new employer. Being all-powerful, he provided what we needed. If we kept close to him and performed his work well. And now let me tell you where I was the time I read that. I had uh, started becoming a massage therapist. Then I developed tendonitis. It was threatening to put me out of business. I'm thinking, oh, my God, you know, it's, it, it's blind people don't just jump from one career to another. You've got to be trained and everything else, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so I'm thinking this one, I, you know, I, and, and someone came by the house and showed me a little home business that they thought I might could do. And I thought, great. Oh, boy, this is good. And so I, I got books and tapes, and I listened to, and I went to meetings and uh, listened to their speakers, and, and I would come home with their tapes and listen to that stuff, and I'd learn all about the company and all about the products, and I'd be ready to go out and, and do this business, and I wouldn't get far down the street before someone would show me one better. Well, so I'd put this one aside and, and join this other one. Of course, it cost a little more money, uh, but it, it looked like it had a little more earning capacity. So then I'd go to those meetings and uh, learn about that group and uh, that business and their products and listen to their tapes. And when I finally thought I was about ready to go out and do the presentation on this thing, I wouldn't get very far down the road for someone to show me when it's even better. Uh, but it cost quite a bit to join, but it looked real promising. And... Over the course of the next five, I mean, before long, I'm having to drive out to drag out the credit cards, and they cost a lot to join, but, and I haven't made back any of the money I've invested on any of these others, but they're promising me I'll get it all back and then some with this one. And, you know, the big book says the more we fought, the worse it got. My fear of financial insecurity was something else. 
And, and I took my wife and me to the brink of bankruptcy in my effort to save us from financial disaster. <laughs> and right in the middle of all that, you know, my, my drinking, and my, my next relapse has broke out and is escalating behind all this fear and stress and worry. And all of a sudden I come in to AA and it says right here, when I sincerely took this position, I had a new employer. <laughs> I thought this is what I've been looking for. <laughs> and he's all powerful and would provide what I needed if I'd keep close to him and perform his work well. And I thought, well, uh, 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 what's the job description? <laughs> well, it, it went right on down there. And it said, in that prayer, it said uh, that I asked God to take away my difficulties, that victory over them would bear witness to those I would help of his power and his love and his way of life. I said, okay, let me get this straight, God. <clears throat> I'm going to turn this mess over to you. And you're going to start snapping things in place. And my job is to share my experience with that. I mean, sign me up. I, I, I'm ready for this. This is what I've been looking for. This is what I was looking for all them years in church, actually. Uh, you know, ever since that first time, they went way back there when I gave my life to God. I've had a heart to serve God. It's just that alcohol kept ruining it. And now I was going to get to become a part of that exclusive and unique work that God does for alcoholics through alcoholics. You know, it says on page 28 that uh, all of us, whatever our race, creed, or color, are children of a living creator with whom we may form a relationship upon simple and understandable terms as soon as we're willing and honest enough to try. So there are terms and conditions to forming a relationship with your creator. And that's what I found right there on page 68. The terms and conditions are real clear. It says that God would do this if I would do this. God will do this if I will do this. And don't forget it. Uh, because those are the terms and conditions of our, of our um, experience with this power of God. You know, it's kind of like uh, making a contract with God or something. You know, you, you hear about all them old rock stars that used to... Uh, make a contract with the devil so they could become rich and famous. <laughs> You've heard about them. And, uh, and of course, after that, all they got to do is fart and they got to hit record. <laughs> <laughs> well, I figured this was sort of like that, you know, that uh, I'm going to make this contract with God. Now, I tell you, if you're going to make a contract with the devil, you better think well before you do that. And it told me right here that if I was going to form this contract with God, I better think well before taking this step. I took it real serious. I took it real serious. Think well before taking this step that I can at last abandon myself utterly to Him. Am I in or am I out? And I decided I wanted in. And it says, okay, then established on this footing... That means I'm supposed to set my feet firmly planted upon this fact. God will do this if I will do this, and don't forget it. Established on that footing. I become less and less interested in myself and my plans and my designs and my running the show because I don't need to be anymore. More and more I become interested in seeing what I can do to help others. Why? Because I'm free to go do that. This is where I quit being a taker in life and started learn, learning to be a giver. I learned that when I, when I put you on my giving side, God got on my, on my receiving side. Established on such a footing. He would do this if I would do this. Keep close to Him and perform His work well. That's our primary purpose, to stay sober and help another alcoholic to achieve sobriety. And it, the big book says we have been given a great sense of purpose and that it is accompanied by a growing consciousness of the power of God. Lord have mercy. I know today that somehow me getting whatever I need from God is going to be connected to and in response to me keeping close to Him and performing His work well. And there is nothing else. There is nothing else. So how do I do that? Well, step four through nine is how I get close to God. Them steps I never did before to remove the things that block me. 
I do steps 4 through 9 to establish a conscious contact with God to get close to Him. I do steps 10 and 11 to keep close to Him. And step 12 is to perform His work well. So the rest of the steps are just how I do step 3, my step 3 decision. And, you know, there's a lot of good promises coming through them steps 4 through 9 that are worth making note of. You know, it says we, be, we begin to feel the nearness of our Creator. We may have had certain spiritual beliefs, but now we have a spiritual experience. That we will comprehend the word serenity. We will know peace. We will intuitively know how to handle situations which used to baffle us. We will suddenly realize that God is doing for us what we could not have done for ourselves. What an awakening it is to come through those steps. This thought brings us to step 10, which suggests we continue to take personal inventory and continue to set right any new mistakes as we go along. We vigorously commence this way of living. Vigorously. As we cleaned up the past, we have entered the world of the Spirit. What does that mean? Well, I know one thing it means. It says that the central fact of our lives today is the absolute certainty that our Creator has entered into our hearts and lives in a way which is indeed miraculous. That's what we've entered into if I work them steps right. This thought brings me to step 10, which suggests that I continue to take personal inventory and continue to set right any new mistakes as we go along. Now, here's how we keep close to him and perform his work well. 84, page 84. Continue to watch for selfishness, dishonesty, resentment, and fear. When they crop up, we ask God at once to remove them. We discuss them with someone immediately. We make amends quickly if we've harmed anyone. Then we resolutely turn our thoughts to someone we can help. Now, if you're around me very long, you'll get sick of hearing me quote that. <laughs> but I tell you what, the, that old man that I asked to be my sponsor, I got sick of hearing him quote it. <laughs> And he used he was he started that group I go to and uh, and you know out of respect people would sometimes say to the old man uh, Big E you got anything you want to say today and he'd say um, yeah are y'all continuing to watch for selfishness dishonesty yeah it, that's, that's all he ever said you know if you came into the meeting some morning and your, your halo wasn't on quite right he he you know he'd catch you by the coffee thing he'd say how's your serenity today boy uh, it's a little off today Ed he'd say are you continuing to watch for selfishness dishonesty <laughs> You know, and you'd say, uh, uh, no, I, I haven't done that yet, Ed. He'd say, well, then, have you asked God at once to remove it and discuss it with somebody? Uh, no, I haven't done that yet, Ed. And he'd say, well, thank God. Because if you had have done that and still felt this way, I wouldn't know what to tell you. <laughs> Ed said this was a ranch that would fit any nut. And what he meant was... <laughs> What he meant was that this passage right here is the whole program in a nutshell. Grab it and apply it to any problem. And it'll start the gears to turning to bring it to, to grind out the solution. Now, of course, at this point in my recovery, I'm just getting annoyed that I've got this old man to be my sponsor that only knows one passage from the big book. <laughs> and, and, you know, I, that's what I thought of him until the day that uh, I got a letter from Social Security. It was about this time of year, middle of November. I got a letter from Social Security because I get a little bit of a disability check. And we tore open this letter and it said, your disability check is going to be cut $600 a month starting the 1st of December. Two-week notice. That's all I got. And the fear of financial insecurity, which was just kind of starting to go away a little bit, jumped on me with a vengeance and was crushing me to the ground. It felt like a ton of bricks dropped right out of the sky. And, I mean, panic grabbed me and was crushing me in the ground. And in that moment of panic, I heard the voice of God. And it sounded like he had. <laughs> and he said, ask God, it wants to remove that fear, boy. <laughs> Discuss it with someone immediately and make amends quickly if you've harmed anyone and resolutely turn your thoughts to someone you can help. And, uh, you know, my wife and I celebrate Christmas real big every year. We do Christmas shows and all that stuff. And, and I remember when I got that check, I thought, there goes Christmas this year. And I'm sitting here going, what does resolutely mean? Resolutely turn your thoughts to someone you can help. Well, I know that uh, 
on New Year's, people make these New Year's resolutions. And they mean, bless God, come the 1st of January, they're going to quit smoking or go on a diet or something. They mean they're going to plant their feet and, uh, and they're going to dig in. And they're going to lean into that thing and push against it with resolve. And I thought, maybe that's what I'm supposed to do here. Maybe the walls of fear are closing in on me and I'm supposed to push through it and reach out and find someone to help and don't let that paralyze me. And so I did. Called my sponsor, told him. I said, here's what happened. I reported to him. Uh, asked God to remove the fear. I didn't owe any amends in this particular situation. And then I started going to meetings looking for people to help. This is the first time in my recovery program that I wasn't going to the meeting hoping somebody help me stay sober. I I'm going to the meeting firmly focused on finding someone to help. And I didn't feel like I could do a very good job but I was going to do what I could. And if I heard somebody sharing in that meeting that sounded a little down, uh, I'd find them after the meeting and pray with them. Or give them a word or two of encouragement, best I could, didn't know much. Usually I'd be back at home that evening reading my big book and go, oh, wow, this is what I needed to share with them this morning. <laughs> and I'd write that down and go look for them tomorrow and say, hey, y'all. You know what? It changed my whole experience with reading the big book. I started arming myself with facts from this book so that I could win the entire confidence of another alcoholic in a few hours. That became important to me. You know what? We went through Christmas and had no lack of presents. It was a great Christmas. Came to the 1st of January. Me and Norma sat down to do our budget. We do our budget twice a month, first in the middle. And we were a little scared to look at it. And... We added up our bills for the first half of the month of January, and there was enough money in the bank to pay the bill. And we weren't sure how that happened. And Norma said, why don't we go ahead and just kind of add up the whole month? And I thought, oh, I don't know if I want to look that far into the future. <laughs> but we did. You know, we added it up, and it said we were going to hit the end of January about $500 short. And I said, but Norma, if you get scared, ask God at once to remove that fair discussion with someone immediately. <laughs> I thought, oh, starting to sound like Ed now. <laughs> you know what? We came to the 1st of February and all, had money to pay all the bills, and we didn't know how it happened. The 1st of March, all the bills are paid. We didn't know how it happened. 1st of April, 1st of May. And, of course, during this time, we're trying to uh, regain our equilibrium a little bit, make some life adjustments. And, and you know, after about six months, we, we kind of got everything leveled out. But for a while there, it was like, how did that happen? We don't know. We sat down one night. I did. I sat down one time and thought, I'm going to try to figure out, try to remember how that happened. Well, I remember there was a time toward the end of February that I'd better call the bank, make sure that we're uh, not fixing to start bouncing checks, you know, just make sure that we got our checkbook right. I know we're down to the last few nickels and dimes. It said I had $500 in my checking account. Hmm. I don't think I made a $500 miscalculation. We were watching it close, you know. And uh, you say, what, do you, th you think God put $500 in jail? I'd feel like a nut if I said that. <laughs> but to tell you the truth, I'd kind of feel like a nut if I said he did. I don't know what to say. I, I don't know. All I know is it was there. Uh, I waited a few days to see if the bank made any kind of correction. They did not. And, uh, I, oh, man, was I excited. I grabbed my little gratitude journal. I keep one of those. It's a good practice. And I'm flipping through it. I want to find my February page to say, man, you can't believe what happened today. Hallelujah. I can still shout that, too. And, <laughs> And, uh, you know, as I'm turning through that gratitude journal, I flipped past the January page that said, I called the bank today, and there was $100 in the bank more than I thought we had. And I thought, oh, yeah, I remember that. It happened in January, too, for about 100 bucks. You know, uh, in March, there was a, uh, a day. I'm a night person. I stay up all night and uh, sleep during the day. And this particular weekend, I stayed up all Friday night and didn't get the chance to sleep Saturday. And uh, toward the end of the day, Norma said, do you want to go out and do something this evening? I said, no, man, I'm really kind of ragged out. Um, I said, I tell you what, they've been announcing all week they're going to have a great speaker over at our group. So we'll go over there. You can listen to the speaker, and I can doze in the chair. <laughs> so, so we drive over there. It's five minutes to eight. We walk up to the door, and just as I reach for the door, it flies open, and the chairperson comes out and grabbed me and said, Dave, man, our great speaker just called and canceled. <laughs> and I said, Bummer. <laughs> He 
And uh, he said, uh, will you speak? Mm-mm. I want you to, I was just starting to learn how to turn my thoughts to someone like I've been doing this for a few months here, you know, and digging things out of the book and trying to share with people, and I'd started sharing in the meetings some. I was feeling real good about the fact that I was starting to share in the meetings, you know. And, uh, and But, but to, no, the place is packed for a great speaker, and I've never spoken it, not for an hour, no. And I've been up all night, and I haven't slept all night. I said, I don't have the presence of mind. I can't do it. And Norma said, you can too. Another one of them great moments. And she took me aside and prayed with me, and she dragged me in there just like she did now and stuck me up behind the podium. <laughs> and I said, uh, just like I did tonight, I said, I'm uh, Blind Dave. Uh, I was, I was bo- uh, born in 1948, I think. Uh, Houston, uh, 77015. Oh, no, uh, and I was, I, I ain't kidding. I was chugging along there. It was not going well. But, but, you know, about 10 or 15 minutes into it, something happened that I felt and will never forget. One time, me and some friends, I was about 16, and, uh, he just got his first car, and, and, uh, we got us some beer and a bunch of guys, and we went riding out in the country down some dirt road where we could drink without getting caught, you know. And, uh, and it had been raining. And we got way back down there somewhere and slid off that dirt road into a mud ditch and sunk. One of the boys had to walk all the way back to the main highway, hitchhike all the way back to town, got a friend with a record truck who came out there and drove down that dirt road as far as he could, but he couldn't get all the way to us. And he had to stretch that chain and cable and everything he could get way down there to hook onto that car. And he said, okay, he said, give it a little bit of gas, and I'm going to take the slack out of this chain. And I'm sitting there in this car just waiting, and all of a sudden, ka-chunk, the slack came out of that chain. And that car just started going, I mean, we're, we're, oh, howdy. (laughs) You know, we're sliding all over the place, but man, that, that truck, I didn't know them winch trucks had so much power. That thing was dragging us up that hill. And that night, the way I felt, I felt like I was stuck in the mud and, oh, my God, and struggling. All of a sudden, ka-choo. something just grabbed hold of me, and off I, I was going then. And I'll never forget it. One of my greatest experiences I've ever had, and uh, I've had many since, but, uh, but it's always the same. Ka-choo. And you're in tow. God, and you know God's got it now. And when I finished that service, and, uh, and uh, you know, everybody stands and gives you a standing ovation. That's common courtesy, but this, this was not that. They jumped and cheered, and they cheered for a long time. And I couldn't believe they were cheering at me. And um, everybody's all over me talking to me at the end of the meeting. Wow, I was the man of the hour. It felt so good, you know. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, so now everybody's gone. We're the last ones to leave, and we're driving home. And uh, we get home, and uh, Norma says, hey, by the way, somebody gave me a note that said somebody gave them a note to give to me to read to you when we got home. And I said, well, cool, what does it say? And she unfolded this paper, and $500 fell out of it. And we got through March. You know, I can remember those instances. I can remember $100 in January. I can remember $500 in the bank account in February. I can remember that $500 that fell out of that paper in March. Those are, it's like, wow, these big miracles of God. Let me tell you what the big miracle of God was. Because I lost $600 a month over a six-month period. That's, six, that's, that's $3,600. 100 500 and $500 is $1,100. I'm still missing $2,500. And we still got through. Now explain that. The big miracle of God is what you don't see, that you can't add up, that it don't make any sense. All I know is that God said that if I would do this, He would do this. If I would keep close to Him and perform His work well, He would provide what I need. And He did. It says, both you and the new man must walk day by day in the path of spiritual progress. If you persist, what does persist mean? Resolutely turn your thoughts to someone you can help. Push through the fear. Stay on track. If you persist, remarkable things will happen. When you look back, you'll realize that what came to you when you put the situation in God's hands was better than you could have planned or even better than you could figure out how it happened. 
Follow the dictates of your higher power and you will presently live in a new and wonderful world. I don't care what world you're in at this moment. Stay on course. Follow the dictates of your higher power. And you will presently be in a new and wonderful world. And so we sought through prayer and meditation to improve our conscious contact with God. And uh, prayer and meditation, step 11 suggests prayer and meditation. I want you to know, uh, now it's fixing to make some suggestions how to do prayer and meditation. It, it does not say, light a candle, put on some uh, nice New Age music. You, you know what you get when you play New Age music backwards? <laughs> new Age music. <laughs> It, now, here's what it says for an alcoholic. See, uh, if you do some of that, that's great. I'm sure you enjoy that, too. But here's what's important for me. Uh, when I, here's my meditation. When you retire at night, constructively review your day. That is supposed to be my meditation. I am supposed to sit down in prayer and quiet and invite God into that and say, God, help me look at this day. You know, step 10 was all about those big tons of bricks that fall out of the sky and crush you all of it. And it's an emotional, intense moment. And you go, oh, yeah, I better pray. <laughs> step 11 is those days when you say, you know, it's been kind of a nice day today. I think I'll go to bed. And you go, think you need to do an inventory? I don't think so. No, everything seems to be okay. See, step 10 is the obvious. Step 11 is the not so obvious. It's where I say, well, God, help me look at my day anyway. And he starts helping me find the little splinters that I could have overlooked. That you could have easily forgotten. It's called improving your conscious contact with God. And uh, so, you know, I was kind of learning how to, to do this thing. I was beginning to practice the evening review as a meditation. And... Uh, so, and then it says, inquire what corrective measures should be taken. This is why I'm starting to commune with God. God, what should I do about that? Uh, exactly what should I say? When should I go? Uh, and, you know, it's a wonderful experience to feel God starting to get involved in that with you. This is where an alcoholic needs to begin learning to hear the voice of God. It's in taking corrective measures. It's what I call ego deflation. So I was learning that practice and getting pretty good at it, and, and, uh, and most nights going to bed with a good score, feeling real good. Uh, but uh, I'll tell you about a time that I did not. One night uh, we had a hailstorm in South Austin that was bad, real bad, and it tore up all the roofs around there and tore my roof up too. And I called the, uh, the people from, you know, the uh, insurance adjuster or whatever, and he come out and he climbed up here and looked at my roof, and he go, oh, yeah, yeah, you got about $3,200 worth of damage up here. And he said, and uh, you have a $900 deductible, so, uh, th and uh, we'll pay you about, what was that, $25, uh, $2,400, whatever it was he would pay. A $32 minus $9, $3,300 he would pay. And uh, he said, and you've got a year to save up your $900 deductible and settle this claim. I thought, great, because I need a year to save up $900. So, uh, I, I didn't think any more about that until uh, that was in October. We came all the way around to June, and I'm thinking, oh, my God, it's almost here. I better start uh, taking care of this. So I called a, a roofer, and I said, come out here and look at my roof. And he did, and he came down. And he said, yep, you got about $5,000 worth of damage up there. I said, no, no way. That dude told me 3200 And he said, well, he must not have looked good. He said, you got two roofs on up there that I'm going to have to pull both of them off to put a new one. He said, whoever did that last one didn't do it right, and water's leaked all under here. And he said, all your, all your decking's rotten. <coughs> he said, and the, the uh, two befores that jut out past the wall all around the house are rotten, and all your face is rotten. He said, i got to fix all that. And he said, and, and by the way, he said, that's not hail damage. Your insurance isn't going to cover it. Oh, God. Oh, I'm freaking out a little bit. <laughs> and then Norma walks in and says, guess what? I could retire. Five years earlier, if we bought back that five years of my retirement, I said, ah, what do you, how much is that? She said, well, it's $4,250. <laughs> I said, no way. I'm freaking out about the roof, and I've only got a few months to October to do it. She said, well, I've only got to October to do this, too, or the price goes up. I said, no way. I'm uh, and so when I went to bed that night to do my inventory, uh, and it says, uh, are you drifting into worry? I said, Yes. <laughs> So 
so I knew what to do. I was going to, I, I asked God to remove my fear. I was going to get up tomorrow, call my sponsor, tell him about it, you know, and da, 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 da. And I hop in bed, and that dang little voice that I've been working on, learning, you know, about uh, this meditative taking inventory at night and hearing God point out little things and all this, and you kind of get to know the voice of God. And I jumped in bed, and I'm starting to go to sleep, and I hear this little voice say, Did you ever finish paying for your seeing eye dog? <laughs> what the heck? <laughs> Now, now listen, that was back in 1980. Does that count? <laughs> About 82. I mean, 20-something years ago. And I went and got a CNI dog, and they want they say, we want you to pay for it. We don't want some charity organization to pay for it for you. You can pay a dollar a month. We don't care. We want you to pay for it because you'll take better care of the dog if you pay for it. Well, since they weren't really pressuring me, I think I went off and had another relapse and forgot all about it. I don't know, uh, but I ain't thought about it in 20-something years, and I'm saying, God, I got some problems. What do I do? And he says, do you ever finish paying for your sin? I don't want that. <laughs> I did the same thing you did. I said, that ain't God. <laughs> so, you know, I went to bed, and I got up the next day and walked. Uh, it took me most of the day to walk around saying, that wasn't God, that wasn't God. I've been... <laughs> I've been sober for five years now, doing just fine without even thinking about that. That couldn't have been God. And when I finally had myself convinced it wasn't God, it was evening, time to start supper. So I went into the kitchen to start supper, and I got a little radio on the table because I listen to talk radio a lot, and I think it was on uh, public radio that day. And I clicked on the radio, and the first thing that came out of that radio, this lady said, Hi, I'm Jane Doe. And... Uh, Today we're going to be talking to uh, to John Smith. Said uh, John recently went blind and got a CNI dog, and he wants to talk to you about a CNI dog. <laughs> and so I, I did the same thing you do. I turned the radio on. I'm standing there, uh, really, it, it was weird. Just like that kachink. Well, this was another kachink. <laughs> and I'm, I'm standing there, and I looked up at God, and I said, God, I can't afford to pay that right now. And this thing that came booming back at me said, you can't afford not to. What are the terms of our agreement? I will provide what you need if you will keep close to him and perform his work well. And keeping close to him means making the amends and paying them up. Unless, of course, you want to handle this one by yourself, Dave. I said, yes, sir, I can't afford not to. I called C&I and I said, I think I owe you all some money. Uh, he said, when? I said, 1982. He said, oh. he said, good Lord. He said, I don't think we keep records back that far. He said, let me go check the microfilm, and, he, and he, he called me back in three days. He said, yes, sir, Mr. Archibald, you still owe us $35. Oh, oh God, I guess my, one of my ex-wives had managed to pay most of that off. Uh, oh, I was glad. I, oh, me and Norma wrote out a $35 check, and I put it in the mail, and I'm walking back in the house, and I said, God, you sure didn't make a big fuss out of 35 bucks." <laughs> And you know what? And I felt that little voice again say, you didn't know it's 35 bucks. You thought it was a lot more than that. And it took a lot for you to become willing to pay that. And that thing that says, to the extent we do as we think he would have us, he'll match our calamity with serenity, that happened right there. I knew I did what God wanted me to do, and I knew it was in God's hands now. ka -ching. You know what? A few days later, I'm sitting in my living room doing uh, step work with a brand new sponsor. You know, we stop for a cigarette break. We go outside. We're sitting on the porch. He's smoking a cigarette. And I mentioned to him about my, my roof up there. And he said, really? And he climbed up on the roof. And he looked at it. He came down and said, you know, I used to be an old roofer. He said, how much did that insurance guy say he'd pay you? And I said, well, deducting my nine, they'll pay me 23 He said, I can do all that for $2,300. He went and got an old roofer friend of his and came back and did my whole roof for $2,300.
Thank you for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.